Journal Journal Club for this week. Uh, the image in the New England Journal is shown here. Uh, the case concerns a 46-year-old woman who presented with a three-month history of walking difficulty, as we can see here. She has a history of rheumatoid arthritis for 12 years, and she's received various treatments, although somewhat inconsistently. Uh, we can see here that she's knock-kneed, and she has these remarkable calcifications here around both knee joints. She's not a dialysis patient. Uh, we are offered synovial chondromatosis, synovial chondrosarcoma, osteochondritis desiccans, pigmented villonodular synovitis, and disseminated tuberculosis. But I don't think we see enough bony destruction here to make a diagnosis of disseminated tuberculosis. The process is bilateral, and I don't know why chondrosarcomas should show up bilaterally. Um, Osteochondritis desiccans is an aseptic necrosis, and we wouldn't expect a reaction like this. So we're stuck with the diagnosis of synovial chondromatosis. And um, this is for radiologists' uh, picture diagnosis. And if we look at these things, <clears throat> what uh, happens here is a... Uh, um, cartilage metaplasia uh, that results in this uh, chondromatosis. Um, it's, we, here's an example of uh, the same kind of process in the, hip, in the hip joint. Here's an example at the elbow joint. So uh, radiologists are aware of this. The etiology, to my knowledge, is not entirely clear, although the condition has been known for almost 100 years. Um, it's possible that chondrosarcoma can apparently develop in this condition, um, perhaps even bilaterally. This is an example of osteochondrosis desiccans. This is an aseptic necrosis, which can occur in the knee joint. The condition looks entirely different. Now, the first topic in the New England Journal that concerns us is inflammatory bowel disease, particularly um, ulcerative colitis. And we see in plain rentgenogram of the abdomen with a markedly dilated trans, uh, transverse colon, perhaps more than eight centimeters, might make a diagnosis of um, toxic megacolon. We see that the descending uh, colon has a lead pipe appearance. These are typical rentgenographic findings of ulcerative colitis. And if we look uh, through a colonoscope or a sigmoidoscope, it's a very friable mucosa, many episodes of bleeding, and perhaps the development of pseudopolyps. So that's the topic. This belongs to an, an entire spectrum of inflammatory bowel disease. On the one hand, we have Crohn's disease, which is more of a granulomatous condition. And on the other ex extreme, we have ulcerative uh, ulcerative colitis. Now, the topic today involves an antibody, ustekinumab, and this antibody binds to this P40 subunit, which is present on both IL-12 and IL-23. So ustekinumab should probably inhibit, and indeed it does, IL-12 and also IL-23. And both of these um, interleukins uh, signal via uh, appropriate cytokine receptors and uh, result in inflammatory changes that involve uh, IL-17 in the case of IL-23 and uh, interferon gamma and IL-2 signaling and TNF-alpha signaling, things that we might want to block with this anti antibody. So here again, IL-23 is a heterodimeric cytokine that binds to an appropriate cytokine receptor that results in this signaling. Uh, and IL-12 is a, also a heterodimeric cytokine that signals by, by its appropriate receptors as shown in this figure.
So ustekinumab was given as induction and maintenance therapy in ulcerative colitis patients. The, compact, the antibody was given in two different doses as shown here. And that treatment was compared to placebo. These patients with ulcerative colitis also got a bunch of other medications, amino salicylates, corticosteroids, uh, et cetera. As, uh, and these distributions were similar across the three groups. The primary endpoint at eight weeks of treatment was clinical remission. Uh, remission can be judged with the Mayo Clinic scales or um, other kinds of tools. Uh, although these patients also underwent endoscopy and biopsy to look at an endoscopic response as well as a histological response. And so if we look at the statistical evaluation, clinical remission, yes, ustekinumab beat placebo. Um, endoscopic improvement, again, ustekinumab at both doses beat placebo. Uh, clinical response, ustekinumab beats placebo. And even the histology was better with ustekinumab compared to placebo. And if we look at the number of patients uh, that maintained a clinical response and endoscopic improvement and corticosteroid free remission and uh, uh, remission after the treatment involved eight weeks, but uh, remission at week 44, again, the ustekinumab groups do better than placebo. Serious adverse events seem to be under control, although, the number of subjects that were studied here are, again, relatively small, so uh, complete judgment can't be made. I was a little bit concerned that seven patients in the ustekinumab group got cancer compared to only one patient in the placebo group, but several of these were uh, non-melanotic skin cancers, uh, presumably uh, squamous cell skin cancers that were relatively easily treated. The next topic in the New England Journal, again, concerns ulcerative colitis. But in this case, we're discussing an antibody against the alpha-4 beta-7 integrin. Now, this is a surface molecule, and uh, this surface molecule is involved in CD4 T-cell homing, as shown in this previous paper that was published in the Journal of Immunology almost 10 years ago. Now, antibodies against integrins, I think, would cause some concern because there's another antibody against alpha-4 integrin that's used for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. And the complication of that antibody can result in progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is a complication we'd rather avoid. So vedolizumab is an antibody against alpha-4 beta-7 integrin, which again, as we just learned, is involved in the homing of T lymphocytes. So again, it's a different approach to block immunological processes that might play a role in ulcerative colitis. Now, the antibody against alpha-4 beta-7 integrin was compared to adalimumab, which is an antibody that uh, is, is directed against TNF-alpha, which is an accepted treatment for ulcerative colitis. So in this study, um, we don't have a placebo group. This is a comparison of vedolizumab, alpha-4 beta-7 integrin antibody compared to ad adalimumab, a standard treatment for relatively severe ulcerative colitis directed against TNF-alpha. The primary outcome in this study was clinical remission at week 52. And if we look at the patients here, they're over 385 patients in the two groups, and they look fairly well um, distributed in terms of clinical parameters and uh, uh, previous therapies. Most of these patients had gotten, yeah, or some of these patients had gotten previous therapy with an alpha TNF alpha inhibited inhibitor. Of course, none of them had been exposed to vedolizumab. So what we see here is the the red group is the vedolizumab group, the blue group is the adalimumab group, and if we look at clinical remission and endoscopic improvement, it looks 
as if things are a little bit more in favor of uh, vedalizumab compared to adalimumab. But at any rate, vedalizumab doesn't seem to be any worse than adalimumab. And if we look at histological remission, uh, according to uh, various scores, also the results seem to favor, favor vedalizumab. And if we look at patients with a clinical response, the vedalizumab group seems to do a little better than the adalimumab group, although as a non-gastroenterologist, I don't think these differences are profound. And if we look at uh, adverse events, I was relieved to find out that at least in the alpha uh, four beta seven integrin group, nobody developed multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Otherwise, the complication rates seem to be about the same. So the authors conclude that vedolizumab beats adalimumab in the treatment of ulcerative colitis. The next study concerns severe asthma and young black children. And the question that was asked here is, uh, do the responses of black children differ from what's been previously published for white children or adults of either ethnic group? And I would remind you that uh, the abbreviation LAVA, long-acting beta agonist uh, therapy, uh, this also played a role in these children. And the, the children were um, compared to adolescents and adults of different ages. And uh, their responses to these treatments with Salmeterol, a long-acting beta agonist, and uh, their steroid requirements and their various treatments are shown as outlined. Couldn't follow all of this exactly, but there were some differences in the responses of uh, these children compared to how adults respond, although the long-acting salmeterol strategy seemed to be a good idea, and uh, a, a lot of these Black children with asthma required uh, steroid therapy. So there was also a double fluticasone group that was involved here. And there are some subtle differences across these groups. And uh, the authors draw attention to the fact that these young black children respond somewhat differently than young white children. But at any rate, long acting beta agonists seem to be a good idea for all of these, uh, for irrespective of what ethnic group we belong to. And uh, the amount of uh, steroid that had to be given in increased stepped up doses was substantial. And um, I learned in the supplement that adrenal axis suppression occurs in young children. And there were a lot of these. And one, we saw this review on Addisonian crisis earlier. Uh, if these children have enough adrenal axis suppression uh, with these medications, they might be at risk for uh, these complications because, as we learned earlier, the half-life of uh, uh, adrenal cortical steroids is relatively brief. So kids are kids, and LAVAs beat SABAs, at least in my opinion, and the amount of steroids that had to be given to these children Black children was perhaps a little higher than what's previously been given to white children. Now, the next topic in the New England Journal involves CCR5. This is CC motive, motif chemokine receptor 5. It's shown here. Uh, it's expressed uh, on T cells, but it's also expressed on other cells in the body. And the point here to keep in mind is the incorporation of HIV uh, AIDS virus intracellularly involves CD4 in conjunction with CCR5. And this combination is shown here, how HIV virus enters cells. There's good reason to believe that individuals that don't, don't express CCR5 have a resistance against HIV. And the spontaneous appearance of patients that don't express CCR5 is not common, uh, but it is described. And the patients that don't express CCR5 seem to be a resistant to HIV. 
Now, all of this was a point in treatment about 10 years ago when a patient in Berlin that had HIV uh, also developed leukemia and he received an allergenic bone marrow transplant from a patient that had the CCR5 Delta 32 variant. And um, this patient uh, expresses a truncated form of CCR5 that is not incorporated in the cell membranes. This is the variant uh, that seems to be resistant. Patients that harbor this variant seem to be resistant to HIV. So this patient, shown here, uh, received this bone marrow transplant with the CCR5 Delta 32 deletion and thereafter appeared to be healed from HIV. Now the treatment that was available for HIV, the retro, uh, intense retroviral treatment 10 years ago was not as good as what we have today, uh, but um, that was that, that story. Now what we've learned subsequently, it used to be believed that CCR5 Delta 32 um, was a fortunate thing to have but subsequent epidemiological studies suggest that people with this mutation have a decrease in overall survival for a variety of um, epidemiological reasons. So this is Klinikum Steglitz, where this patient called the Berlin patient received his bone marrow transplant that then putatively resulted in a, in a cure from HIV. Uh, his report appeared in the New England Journal about 10 years ago. So this report in the New England Journal also involves an HIV patient that develops a T-cell leukemia. And this patient is treated with a bone marrow transplant. This is a Chinese patient and his bone marrow was treated with a CRISPR-Cas treatment to, in an attempt to eliminate CCR5. So this patient received a bone marrow transplant with bone marrow cells that had been treated with an attempt to eliminate, to edit the CCR5 locus to eliminate it. And this report that we're going to look at now is basically a um, safety report. Uh, can patients be treated with uh, CRISPR-Cas treated cells? And do they have a problem with this? Or are there side effects from this? Uh, the authors really didn't intend the, for this report to represent a novel treatment for HIV, although such reports might be coming. This patient also received methotrexate and basiliximab, an anti-CD25 antibody, and mycophenolate mofetil, and glucocorticoids, and tacrolimus, and whatever is given to patients that receive bone marrow transplants and also for the treatment of graft versus host disease. And what we can see here is uh, platelet counts, <clears throat> hemoglobin, lymphocyte counts, and neutrophils, and the bone marrow transplant seemed to work, and they got his leukemia in complete remission, but the amount of cells circulating that didn't express CCR5 hovers around 8%, so it seems that the Genome editing against CCR5 was only very modestly effective in this Chinese patient. But if we look at his values, uh, uh, laboratory values before and after transplantation, uh, they, they basically look like he tolerates all this fairly well. Uh, his antiretroviral therapy was eliminated for several days, but then his uh, um, Although his CCR5, he then expresses some cells that have CCR5 indels at a higher level than the basal level, and his viral load does increase so that we cannot conclude that this CCR5 deletion in this experiment was an effective treatment against HIV. So in the discussion of this entire report, the investigators admit that CCR5 ablated cells were relatively modest. Uh, but uh, they seem to identify uh, no specific side effect associated with uh, this deletion. They also draw attention to the fact that CCR5 Delta 
32 mutation is associated with reduced life expectancy. And so we'll have to see where this issue then eventually ends. But to my knowledge, this is the first report of um, CRISPR-Cas edited uh, cell administration in humans, and the report is from Chinese investigators. Now, the first review in the New England Journal concerns uh, COPD, chronic obstructive lung disease. Just wanted to remind you of the so-called gold definition, uh, which is based on FEV1 results in patients, and you can classify the patients in stage one, stage two, stage three, or stage four in terms of severity, and what these stagings mean in terms of uh, uh, clinical presentations of these patients and uh, how many hospitalizations they have, et cetera, just as a background report. And uh, the authors here draw attention to the fact that we're well aware that COPD is a consequence of smoking, but there are also, also other reasons, and some people that never smoke develop COPD, and that's not merely patients with uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or with uh, cystic fibrosis of diseases or diseases of this sort. But what we can see here is um, uh, the increase in pulmonary function uh, as we reach puberty and a maximum at perhaps age 25 and then in adulthood, this declines with aging, whether or not we smoke. And this decline is influenced by environmental Smoking obviously also is an environmental influence, but other reasons and genetic factors uh, and uh, so that uh, adults as they get older show either an, a, an early decline, below normal function, um, normal function, or even super normal function for a very fortunate few. And uh, the authors draw attention to a correlation between thickness of airway thickness and disappearance of small airways uh, as a correlation with loss of FEV1. And that's shown here and also some histological examples and also uh, the prolifer pro proliferation of various kinds of cells and lymphoid follicle follicles, et cetera, in terms of the graded severity of COPD. The authors also draw attention to the disappearance of small airways uh, and the histological differences of what we call panlobular emphysema in comparison to central lobular emphysema as a function of these uh, gold classifications, a decrease in FEV1. Genetic influences, and here are genome-wide associations. I don't know exactly what these individual genes are, but we can imagine that the genetic effect of each individual site is probably relatively modest, but if you have a constellation of these, perhaps your genetic risk for COPD is increased. So this is more of a mechanistic report, whereas the next review in the New England Journal is more clinically oriented, again with the gold classification. And the first thing that strikes us is a difference in uh, European countries or even the United States compared to COPD uh, cases in China and India. And I would imagine that this is not related to genetic differences between Chinese and Indians and the rest of us, but more because of the pollution and environmental problems that these countries have. And this is an algorithm for the evaluation of patients. And again, FEV1 classification according to the gold scale is shown here. And whether or not these patients benefit from having uh, sensitive CT evaluations or other tests um, that might be available is outlined in this algorithm. And there's also a treatment algorithm. And again, uh, long-acting muscarinic antagonists called LAMAs and long-acting beta-2 agonists called LABAs. We've already discussed this. And patients that have an asthmatic component receive glucocorticoids combined with these 
agents. And then attention is also drawn to the inhibition of phosphodiesterase 4. Roflumilast is a medication that inhibits phosphodiesterase 4. And this phosphodiesterase uh, plays a role in the pathogenesis of chronic obstructive lung disease and might be a treatment target that you can consider. The drug, is, as far as I know, is approved. So in my view, it's still a problem of smoking and vaping, although as we've learned, other environmental influences, diesel exhausts, if you live in Stuttgart, et cetera, might play a role. This image in the New England Journal is a small girl from Nepal uh, who has pharyngitis. And what we see here, uh, this is a pseudomembrane, highly suggestive of diphtheria. And uh, this child had not been vaccinated against diphtheria. Diphtheria was shown by the polymerase chain reaction, and this child died. Here again is the woman from last week with levido reticularis due to cold agglutinins. And we can see that her blood agglutinates at a cold temperature compared to warming. And uh, this patient, uh, uh, first of all, she was warmed. Uh, she received blood transfusions because of her hemolytic anemia. She was also treated with rituximab. Um, she got better, but the rash didn't get much better. The patient in the New England Journal is a 65-year-old woman who has lung cancer and chest pain. Uh, she has a previous history of smoking. And if we look at this plain rentgenogram, she's got some suspicious lesion looking lesions here. Uh, uh, these are verified by CT and PET-CT. And a biopsy is consistent with non-small cell lung cancer in this poor patient. And she's treated with uh, four cycle, uh, uh, cycles of carboplatin and uh, um, other agents for non-small cell lung cancer. Now, probably one of the treatments that's uh, been introduced for non-small cell lung cancer that we've discussed quite a bit in this exercise is blockade of PD-1 and PD-1 ligand with an antibody. She also receives blockade of PD-1 ligand and subsequently develops chest pain. She receives a whole, a whole variety of different medications for various items shown here. And if we look at her laboratory values, first presentation, she's got an elevated troponin T value here and repeated measurements of troponin T are either on the borderline or are clearly elevated as indicated here. So she has an electrocardiogram done. She has an axis of plus 90 degrees. And if we look at this electrocardiogram, 25 millimeters per second, doesn't look too remarkable. She's got nonspecific ST and some T wave flattening, but it really doesn't look like uh, acute coronary syndrome electrocardiogram. Um, additional studies, done on admission show collapse of a segment of the left upper lobe that's shown here. And um, a variety of tests are done to try to elucidate this chest pain. She also receives coronary angi angiography, which is not consistent with um, acute coronary syndrome. And the discussant here discusses a variety of differential diagnostic possibilities, including myocardial ischemia, pericarditis, pulmonary embolism. I think that was probably ruled out by our CP, uh, parenchymal lung disease, and also myocarditis. And that is the clue here, because this patient had been treated with nivolumab, which is this blocker of PD-1, PD-1 ligand signaling to restore aggressive T cell function. Now, what's appreciated now, or at least since 2014, is that this treatment can result in myocarditis, which would be responsible for chest pain. And indeed, a myocardial biopsy is done in this uh, very uh, cooperative patient, which shows clear evidence of myocarditis. And this myocarditis is attributed to nivolumab treatment. And um, 
Myocarditis with nivolumab is not that common, but has certainly been described since 2014. That was the anatomic diagnosis in this patient. Uh, this picture is of Axel Ulrich, and Axel Ulrich is a German biochemist and molecular biologist who was one of the co-recipients of this year's Lasker Award. And I wanted to draw that to your attention because the Lasker Award was given uh, to investigators, Axel Ulrich, Dennis Slamon, and Michael Shepard that are responsible for the HER2 receptor pathway signaling and HER2 positive breast cancer and an antibody treatment uh, against HER2. And uh, the discussant here points out that this is a phenomenal success story in breast cancer patients that express HER2. And a brief review of this issue here. And so we congratulate these investigators for elucidating that pathway and providing these women with an additional game changer, blockbuster option for breast cancer. Uh, then in a letter to the editor in the New England Journal, I just want to draw attention to this. Uh, there are apps for contraception, which I think is probably a pretty good idea. And these can be accessed through websites or smartphones. And uh, these authors of this letter to the editor in the New England Journal draw attention to these apps. And because they conducted a secret shopper study to evaluate the precision of these contraceptive apps. And actually the precision of these contraceptive apps, these are fake patients that they presented to these apps. And the precision in my view wasn't that bad, uh, but everything is uh, possible for improvement. And um, that was the author's point in this particular letter to the editor. And I was also interested in the fact that Spiegel Online um, also drew attention uh, to contraception and uh, in the, these Spiegel Online reports, uh, 214 million women on the planet don't have access to contraceptive methodology for one reason or another. And in a UN report in 51 countries, uh, that's also the case where very few women have access to contraceptive methodologies. And as we know, we have 2020, we have 7.7 billion people on the planet. And then depending upon whether or not you're a pessimist or a mindless optimist or what probably will happen, we can see that the progressive increase in the population explosion uh, continues unabated. Now in the Lancet, the first paper is on causes of death in China, according to the Global Burden of Disease Study. Now they're just celebrating their 70th anniversary of their republic. So this is a timely paper by Chinese authors concerning causes of death in China. And you will not be surprised to learn that the Chinese die of the same things that we do. And uh, you won't be able to read this complicated table, but on the list, on top are stroke and ischemic heart disease. Uh, then uh, lung cancer, chronic obstructive lung disease. Liver cancer is higher than we would expect here, but road injuries are higher up there. The poor Chinese also get Alzheimer's disease and hypertensive heart disease and all the various falls and drowning and all the various things that we do. Uh, so if, if you, you can see the changes that have happened in China since 1990 to uh, 2017, it's almost a 30, years, 30 year span. And what we see here is the leading causes of death in China in 2017, stroke, ischemic heart disease, lung disease. We also already saw this dramatic graph in the New England Journal. Um, and uh, these various causes of death, which are not that different than what we see here. Systolic blood pressure, greatest risk factor for death, uh, but amongst the Chinese, smoking is way up there. 
Now, how the investigators calculated that salt intake has such an important impact on uh, over one and a half million deaths, I'm not certain, but um, you can look at the report for details. So systolic blood pressure and smoking seem to be the most important variables that one might be able to adjust in China. And if you believe the salt business, you can also focus on that. And these colorful graphs um, show various different provinces in China and how these various factors differ across provinces. So I think we can conclude that the poor Chinese have the same problems that we do. The next report in The Lancet is fairly complicated. Uh, it's a huge meta-analysis on the risk of menopausal hormone therapy in terms of the development of breast cancer. Now, I thought we were done with this topic, but we aren't quite, because the menopausal hormone therapy that some women still prefer differ in terms of whether, in terms of risk, whether it's a, pr a product that has also progestins, whether or not these are given cyclically, whether or not it's strictly uh, concerning an estrogen preparation without progestins, the risk of developing breast Breast cancer also is influenced by age. So if we look at the habits of women in terms of postmenopausal hormone therapy to diminish symptoms, uh, this rose progressively until these reports from about 15 years ago from the Women's Health Initiative, et cetera, suggesting that there might be risk here. Uh, so the ingestion of these products has decreased since the year 2000 to a lower level, but still higher than it was in 1970. And if we look at um, estrogen only and estrogen, estrogen plus progesterone, the relative risk of developing breast cancer is yes, there's a relative risk, but actually it's relatively small and it's also age dependent. And it's also a function of how long the women ingest these preparations and you can look at details here but basically what we see here is down here the women that never used uh, estrogen uh, the, uh, preparations whether or not they have estrogen positive cancers or estrogen negative cancers are all breast cancer compared to breast cancer risk of women that only take estrogens compared to women that take estrogens and progestins and all, as a plot, plotted against body mass index, you can look at the details here uh, on your own, but basically the risk of developing breast cancer for women that have taken these products for five to 10 years is about uh, one in 50 women for a combination preparation compared to one in 200 women for women that just take merely estrogens and you can inspect the individual details here. Uh, the next topic involves ticagrelor, and ticagrelor is a reversible P2Y12 antagonist that's, that's commonly given to patients after percutaneous coronary interventions, particularly if they've re received a stent. And if you think ticagrelor is better than clopidogrel, uh, probably largely a marketing effect, but Clopidogrel has to be converted to an active component, and there are some people that have resistance to that, and uh, uh, we've discussed that topic ad nauseum in the past. So in this particular study, ticagrelor was uh, given to patients with diabetes who had stable coronary artery disease. Most had stents, but they, also had, also, they all had a history of previous percutaneous coronary interventions. Uh, they got aspirin as an additional treatment. And if we look at uh, in terms of cumulative events, it's somewhat less statistically significant over 54 months in the ticagrelor group compared to the placebo group. Um, but the number at risk for developing hemorrhage is greater in the ticagrelor group compared to the group that got aspirin alone. So you pays your money and takes your choice. And uh, the investigators seem to imply that the benefits of ticagrelor are better than the risks of hemorrhage. But if we look at this, 
Chicago law against placebo time since randomization myocardial if we look at the balance between all cause mortality myocardial infarction stroke or developing fatal bleeding or intracranial hemorrhage maybe the people are a little bit better off with Chicago law I'm not so certain and uh, the Benefit is also a function of the time that's elast, uh, elapsed since the percutaneous coronary intervention in years, and uh, details can be inspected here. The next study is a fairly impressive study. This is a randomized controlled study of early delivery or expectant management in pregnant women that either have preeclampsia or have some sort of particular preeclampsia risk. This study was uh, performed in many centers, but uh, 46 maternal units uh, across England, Wales, and also in India. And um, I thought it was a pretty important study. So basically what we're comparing here is what's perinatal risk how do the kids do? How do the infants do compared to how the mothers do with either an early induction of labor or a more delayed induction of labor? And as you might expect, the mothers do better with early induction and the children do worse with early induction. They'd rather stay inside the uterus a little longer. And you can look at these tabular data, but if we look here, primary and maternal outcomes favors planned delivery. The mothers seem to do better. Uh, the kids do better with expected expectant management. Uh, but the discussions here suggest that on the whole, um, depending upon what blood pressures are and the clinical appearance of these women, uh, the induction management might be better for both. And then we'll close with this case, also in the New England Journal. This is an active a response um, case, and it concerns a 64-year-old woman who presented to an emergency room with shortness of breath and fatigue. She has trouble climbing stairs. She's also lost 5.4 kilograms in weight since her symptoms presented. And we take a history, and she's got gastrointestinal gastroesophageal reflux disease, she has migraine headaches, she's had supraventricular tachycardia is a type unknown, and she's also depressed and takes medication for depression and for her migraine headaches, and uh, verapamil probably presumably also for migraine headaches, and she's a retired nurse, and she used to drink a bit, but apparently doesn't anymore. She used to smoke quite a bit, but stopped, and has two adult children, et cetera, and looks very unhappy. And if we look at her laboratory values, we can see why. I hope you can see this, but her hematocrit is 12 volumes per cent. It should be 45. So she has a hematocrit of 12, a hemoglobin of 3.8 grams per deciliter. Her sodium is 133. Her chloride is 93. Her bicarbonate is only 15. And her anion gap is uh, elevated. So she has an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And to my astonishment, uh, the discussants here ignore that completely. Now, I admit that her anemia is the most important problem, uh, but uh, a nephrologist would be concerned about these things, although the discussants were not. She has an elevated alkaline phosphatase, but the rest of the values here are pretty good. Her vitamin B12 level is normal, her folic, folic acid level is normal, uh, her uh, methylmalonic acid level is uh, uh, also pretty normal, it's, at least it's not elevated, homocysteine levels are normal. Uh, her LDH level is not particularly elevated, so this does not appear to be a hemolytic anemia. And if we look at her mean corpuscular volume, it's 112. So she has a macrocytic, non-hemolytic, profound anemia. So we look at this in a little more detail, and you can see that here. Her hematocrit's 12, hemoglobin is 3.8, platelet count is not elevated, 
uh, mean corpuscular volume is elevated, reticulocyte count is low, a reticulocyte count ought to be 15%. LDH level is normal, so this is not a hemolytic anemia. If your vitamin B12 is okay, folic acid is okay, methylmalonic acid levels are down where they should be, homocysteine is not elevated, uh, and uh, these other tests are also not remarkable. So why does an older woman have an adequate of 12? And it's, uh, is this blood loss with this macrocytic anemia? I don't really think so. Um, so we might look at her peripheral smear, and that was also available. And uh, in the interactive case report in the New England Journal, you can look at these peripheral smears and also increase them in size and look at the white cells and see if they're multilobular and uh, see how many platelets she's got, et cetera. So we're asked, what could this be? Uh, alcoholism causes a macrocytic anemia, but it doesn't cause a hematocrit of 12. You know, if she had a hematocrit of 35, maybe okay, but not 12. Copper deficiency, never seen it. In the literature, it's listed as being responsible for anemia. Uh, hemolytic anemia, we've already ruled out. Hypothyroidism, no reason to believe in that. She's got a little bit elevated alkaline phosphatase, but her other liver values are normal. My choice would be myelodysplastic syndrome. Although her platelet count is normal, might be expected to be increased. Her peripheral smear was actually, in my view, pretty much consistent with myelodysplastic syndrome. That could cause a hematocrit of 12. And so that's up there. So the anemia is further evaluated and she gets a bone marrow and she doesn't have myelofibrosis or myelodysplastic syndrome. And here are some cells that are shown here. Didn't help me very much but she's got um, no evidence of clonal mutations. So she doesn't have myelodysplastic syndrome. It doesn't look like a lymphoma or leukemia. So they measured her copper levels and those were very low. And I'm not familiar with copper deficiency. And where do we get copper? Well, from nuts and green vegetables, of course, and from seafood and all of these various things. Now, I think it's probably impossible to get copper deficient unless you have malabsorption. But we have no symptoms of malabsorption in this patient. At least we're not given that she has diarrhea or smelly stools or these various things that we associate with malabsorption. She didn't have a gastric bypass operation. Could she have celiac disease? Or is this also a zinc problem? Or is this poor nutrition based on alcohol abuse, but a hematocrit of 12? I wouldn't think so. So she's evaluated further. And indeed, her copper levels are deficient. And she undergoes a gastrointestinal evaluation with duodenoscopy, et cetera. And what's discovered, although I couldn't elucidate any symptoms, celiac disease and antibody levels are consistent with celiac disease. So she's treated with copper supplementation and gets better. A remarkable case you might look at this differential diagnosis of why does a middle-aged woman have a hematocrit of 12 if she's not bleeding and she doesn't have hemolytic anemia. So that was the outcome in this patient. So those are the teaching points. If you've never heard of copper deficiency, in our part of the world, it must involve some sort of malabsorption syndrome. Macrocytic non-hemolytic anemia that can't be attributed to vitamin B12 or folic acid might just cross your mind. Thank you for your attention. And if you want to hear the same business in German, stick around and we'll...